and I know we still have people coming in, uh, but we're going to get started so that we can take advantage of the time that we have. Uh, my name is Marsha Ross Jackson. I'm an assistant dean at Chicago Kent College of Law. And as part of my responsibility, I am uh, involved with our student organizations, uh, various other departments within the law school, uh, involved with trying to ensure that we're paying attention to and staying committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am also a part of the Institute for Law in the Workplace, where I am a senior lecturer and I teach in our labor and employment law certificate program. And so with those responsibilities, I also run some of our pipeline, diversity pipeline programs for high school students and for college students, and also a program we have for our 1L students. So at Chicago Kent, we pride ourselves on really trying to pay attention to ensure that we have an inclusive environment. And given everything that's happening around the country, um, most organizations are really looking for ways to make a strong, firm commitment to ensure that diversity and equity and inclusion are at the forefront of what we do. And we're reaching a point, which I'm very excited about, where more and more people realize that there are systemic barriers that prevent certain groups of color from advancing and from realizing their real potential, which is a detriment to the individual, but also a detriment to the organization because the research supports that truly diverse organizations are more creative, more innovative, better able to solve problems. The, there are many more perspectives that come into play which is very important in the legal world. So in thinking about ways to keep our message alive and to ensure that we hold ourselves accountable, we started this series called Equity Talks. And, you know, speaking of perspective, there are a couple of ways to view that, right? Equity Talks mean describing the event, the forum. We're going to have some discussion but also equity talks, meaning equity speaks loudly. It speaks volumes, it's important. It demonstrates value. And so what we really wanna do is to, to, to bring together law students, lawyers, and the community to discuss ways that we can dismantle systemic racism that is created by the law. And I, I was asked to give a quote and I'll share that. Um, on why this, this series is important. And I said that society can no longer plead ignorance to the existence of systemic racism and its disproportionate effects on access to safety, housing, education, jobs, wealth, criminal justice, healthcare, et cetera, for black and brown communities in this country. <clears throat> Evidence that systemic racism exists has been amplified by a few pandemics, uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic and the long list of Black people murdered by the police. It is beyond time that we really focus on these conversations and start collectively working together to dismantle systemic barriers that our laws and our justice system have imposed upon communities of color. So it's not easy and we're not acknowledging that it is. We understand that the journey to focusing on systemic racism is critical, but also complex. And so there are three things that uh, we'd like to get out of this series. And they're very similar to our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. forums that we hold annually. And that is we want people to walk away with understanding, but most importantly, with some action items. We want people to figure out how they can get involved in addressing whatever issues we're discussing during our series. And so I'd like to make it very simple for, for all of our participants as you think through and as you listen today. And I want you to think about three things, and I call them my three A's, right? 
acknowledge, assess, and act. So first, acknowledge that systemic racism exists. And this might cause some of us to have to believe things that we have not seen or that we have not experienced or that we think, oh, that certainly doesn't happen, right? That's required. Secondly, to assess. Assess the root cause of the problem. So often what we get focused on is the barrier. We see the problem. I like to give the example of a law, lawyer of color in a large firm like I was and trying to develop business and to advance throughout the partnership ranks. Well, where are some of the barriers, right? We'd have to look at what those are. As a first generation lawyer, Right? I didn't have access to clients or people who were able to pay the fees that we were charging. So I was unable to bring in business. I wasn't always the person selected to meet with the client for a variety of reasons. So how do we create space to tear down these barriers that may be invisible? So looking for the root cause. And then finally act. we like for everyone on the call to think about at least one thing that you can do to begin to dismantle these barriers of systemic racism. And we're not talking about personal. We're not talking about focusing inward, inwardly, although that's important, but we're talking about systems. Where are the barriers, the invisible walls? And we want you to think about that and to walk away with at least one action item that you will engage in when you leave this session. And we will do this at each of our sessions. So with that, I thank you for coming. I'm sure you're gonna enjoy this event. It is a spinoff from our very first Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Forum that we held in January of 2016, which was in response to the incidents around the Laquan McDonald shooting. And we are fortunate to have three of those speakers back to talk to you about where we are five years later. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly Calvanico our Director of Continuing Legal Education, to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Marsha. It's with great pleasure that I get to introduce our three speakers today. The first up is going to be David Harris, who's the Sally Ann Semenko Endowed Chair and Professor of Law at the University of Pittsburgh. There, he focuses on the intersection of race and criminal law. He's recognized as the leading national expert on racial profiling. In his 2002 book, Profiles in Justice, and his many scholarly articles on the topic resulted in new laws and regulations in hundreds of police departments across the country. He is also the creator and the host of the Criminal Injustice podcast devoted to interviews with justice system actors, advocates, and journalists, and focused on the commentary of the most difficult issues in the criminal justice system. He has applied his expertise to create better relationships between police and the people they serve to try to bring about the respectful and just policing in public, while maintaining public safety. In 2015, he was recognized with the prestigious Jefferson Award for Public Service. Today, we welcome him back to Chicago Kent to speak about his latest book, A City Divided, Race, Fear, and the Law in Police Confrontations, which tells the story of an 18-year-old Pittsburgh high school student, Jordan Miles, and three Pittsburgh police officers. The book takes an in-depth look at the police and the team. What went wrong? What happened between the, the police and the team? Did the courts respond with a just solution? And most importantly, can we prevent these tragedies from happening in the future? Joining David today are two commentators, Chicago area attorneys Jeanette Samuels and Karen Shelley. Jeanette Samuels is an activist and civil rights attorney with the law firm of Schiller, Prayer, Gerard, and Samuels. Notable cases include Campbell v. City of Chicago, a federal class action lawsuit seeking a consent decree to oversee the Chicago Police Department, and People v. Jason Van Dyke, in which she disqualified the Cook County State's Attorney and had a special prosecutor appointed for the unjustified murder of Laquan McDonald. Ms. Samuels served on the Board of Directors for the Legal Assistance Foundation, 
is a volunteer attorney with the Illinois Torture Inquiry and Relief Commission, which reviews allegations of police torture. And she also provides pro bono legal advice and services to various Chicago area community organizations. When not working, she regularly speaks to students and community organizations on a number of topics, including civil rights, voting, and the importance of education. Ms. Samuels graduated from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, and we're proud to claim her as an alumna of the Chicago Kent College of Law. And last, Karen Shelley. Ms. Shelley is the director of the Police Practices Project for the ACLU of Illinois. Ms. Shelley represents the ACLU and its clients in litigation and policy work addressing police accountability and national security, as well as the First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and discrimination claims. Her voice can be has been at the center of police reform activity in Chicago, always nudging things forward, never backing down. Ms. Shelley is tasked with enforcing the ACLU's agreement with the City of Chicago and Chicago Police Department regarding the police practice of stop and frisk. Prior to joining the ACLU, Ms. Shelley worked at Cleary Gottlieb, Steen and Hamilton as an associate. She then served as a law clerk for the Honorable David G. Traeger of the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York, and she also practiced at Meets, Mulder, Malika, and Glink, representing plaintiffs in employment discrimination and ERISA lit litigation. Ms. Shelley graduated from Columbia Law School in 2004. We couldn't ask for three more knowledgeable speakers on this topic. And there, I'm gonna hand it over to Professor Harris. Thank you. I'm gonna tell you a story of one incident in Pittsburgh in 2010, 10 years ago, uh, that could not be more relevant than it is right now. One incident on Tioga Street in the Homewood neighborhood, but two stories, two stories. Let me tell you those stories. Let me start with the police story. The police story is that three plainclothes police officers in an unmarked car were on anti-crime patrol. They were not a patrol car. They were out there to find guns and drugs in a neighborhood called Homewood, which had a high level of crime and violence. And as they drove down Tioga Street on January 12th, very cold night, 11 p.m., one of them said, that he thought he saw a man, a male figure, squeezed up against a building. They pulled their car down the street, turned it around, and came back to where they'd seen the male figure. And by that time, a man was walking out to the street. They came up on the man, stopped. Several of them, they got out of their car, one at a time, said, Pittsburgh police, can we ask you a question? The man stopped, he seemed surprised. He started to answer their questions, but right away, the police officers knew this guy had a gun. How'd they know that? He had a big, heavy weight, it seemed like, weighting down the right coat pocket that he was wearing. And it was a way he turned his body in a very particular way, as if to shield that particular pocket, and had his hand hovering near it and then inside it. The man answered a few more questions, but then he started to run. He didn't get very far because of the snow and ice on the ground. He went about four steps before he fell face down. And these police officers, knowing that they had a man with a gun, they were out of their car yelling, Pittsburgh police, stay on the ground. The man didn't stay. He tried to get up, but they were on him in a flash. These three men in plain clothes had to struggle and fight with this man to keep him on the ground. He kept trying to push up and get away, and they would push him down. And all the, along, they knew he was armed, and there was the smell of something really bad about to happen. There was a sense that something could go wrong. And when they tried to get his hands behind him to cuff them, and one hand got away, and it went towards that pocket, that was it. One of the officers yelled out, he's going for it. He's going for the gun. And in that instant, all three of the officers thought, he's going to shoot somebody. He's going to shoot one of us. And the officer who was closest to the man's head began to hit him and hit him and hit him as hard as he could. And finally, the man stopped 
struggling. And with that, they were able to get the cuffs on him. They pulled him to his feet, or sorry, to the ground, sat him down, went right for that pocket, and they found a bottle of Mountain Dew soda, which they tossed away. They searched the whole area very thoroughly. They searched him, didn't find a gun. They called a police wagon to take him away. Two uniformed officers showed up and took the man to the hospital and then to jail. They charged him with two felonies, aggravated assault on officers, and then a host of misdemeanors. That's the police story. This is the young man's story. His name was Jordan Miles. Jordan was a senior at the, at the city's performing arts high school. He had turned 18 the day before, January 11th. Uh, he was a viola player. He played in the orchestra. He was on the honor roll. And that night at 11 o'clock, he did what he did every night. He left his mother's house on Tioga Street to walk around the block to where his grandmother lived. They were a very tight family. But that house he lived in with his mom had three other siblings in it, and his grandma had a spare room. So he'd been in his grandmother's house for his bedroom since he was in seventh grade. He didn't get more than a few houses down. And he was walking in the street to avoid all the ice and snow on the sidewalk when he saw this dark colored car down the block with its lights on begin to advance toward him really quick and come up on him so close he actually had to jump back out of the street. When he did that, out came the three men, three large men, all in regular clothes, and they got out of the car and they started to yell at him. And they yelled, where's your gun? Where's your money? Where's the drugs? Give it up. He didn't know what was going on, but he knew this was not good. He thought, I'm probably going to get robbed or something worse. And Jordan tried to run, but he got almost nowhere before he fell face down in the snow. And in an instant, these men were on him and they beat him and they beat him bad and they hit him every time. He tried to get his face out of the snow because he could not breathe. He couldn't breathe. He tried to get his face out of the snow. They would push him down and beat him more. Finally, a rain of heavy blows hit his head. And he stopped. He thought, I guess I'm going to die here. And he just stopped. It wasn't but a minute or so before he was pulled up and sat down, handcuffs, and he saw men in police uniforms. He thought they were there because somebody would called the police, but then those men in uniforms talked to the other ones. And that was when he knew for the first time that those officers were cops. They put him in the wagon. They took him to the hospital because he was injured. Then he went to jail. Now, this story of 10 years ago in Pittsburgh made incredible waves in our town, as I'll tell you in just a few minutes. But I tell it today because in many ways, it's the same story we're talking about now and have been talking about all those 10 years and before that. All right? Now, thank God Jordan didn't die. Thank God for his life. He survived. And his voice is very much present in the book. You know, not all people involved in an altercation like this survive. We all know that. Now, I'm very, very clear that if you read the book, you'll be able to come up with your conclusions about what happened. Because, of course, those two stories are quite different in some important ways. You'll be able to come to your own conclusion about whether or not uh, the police identified themselves. They, they say, without a doubt, they did. Jordan says he never heard anything like that. You'll be able to conclude for yourself whether Jordan had a gun, which the police officers still believe today, or as Jordan said, he never had a gun, never carried a gun, let alone a bottle of Mountain Dew. But that's really not the most important thing I want to talk to you about today. We can talk about what happened. But what's actually more important is why it happened. 
why did this happen and why does it keep happening over and over in cities and towns across the country every day, every night in this country. Because if we can figure out why, maybe we've got a shot at stopping this or curtailing it or changing things. So the central question is why does this keep happening? So let me tell you just a little bit more of the story before we get to those central questions. Jordan, as I said, was taken to a hospital that night. He was drug tested, clean. Uh, he was treated for his injuries, and then he was taken to the jail. He was bailed out the next day by his mother and his grandmother. And he faced two very serious felony charges, aggravated assault on police officer and a host of other criminal charges. Uh, but chances are we would never have heard anything about this case. Um, you know, it would have been just one more night in Pittsburgh for the anti-crime unit, uh, except that a couple of weeks later, just about two weeks, these images hit the local media. Now, there are others. These are comparatively mild. I want you to put yourself back in 2010. This was the date they were taken. It was the, the early morning of, I'm sorry, it was the day of January 13th, the day after Jordan was released. All right, so he's been like this for 12 hours at this point. Um, but before, you know, think of 2010. This is not the day where everything goes viral immediately and there's video everywhere and so forth. It was in every newspaper, it was on every television station, it got some national coverage, right? And instantly, the city was outraged. Voices were raised. It was the mayor, it was the police chief. How could this happen? How does a kid who weighs 150 pounds, is five foot six, is a viola player, at the performing arts high school, honor roll student, never had a problem with the police. How does he end up underneath a pile of very large, supposedly well-trained police officers getting this treatment? How does that happen four houses down from where his mother lives and where he left from? How? And very quickly, the city erupted. These are students from Jordan's high school, the Performing Arts High School called Kappa, which has a downtown campus. They marched out of school to the courthouse in this demonstration, and the kids were not alone. Uh, the adults, everybody came. This began to happen all the time, and it did not let up. How could this happen? The officers were put on administrative leave. They were paid, but they were off the street. And three investigations started as the demonstrations continued and continued. All right, A federal investigation, a state-level DA's investigation, and an internal investigation in the police department. People were just outraged. But this, it, it very quickly became apparent that not everybody was of the same mind. It was about six weeks after this incident uh, when the first hearing occurred in the case. This, for criminal procedure geeks, this was the, uh, the uh, uh, preliminary hearing. And if you know criminal procedure a little bit, you know this is the first thing, first formal thing uh, that happens in the case. And it has a very limited job. The only job at the preliminary hearing, which is only a judge, there's no jury, is to figure out whether there is enough evidence to show probable cause to have a trial. Not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, just probable cause that a crime was committed and this person was probably involved. That's it. That's all you have to show. And then the case goes forward to trial. These are usually slam dunks for the prosecution. Here, the off, one of the three officers testified. Uh, a civilian also testified who contradicted some of what the officer had to say. And to everyone's shock, the judge in the case threw out the charges against Jordan, 
threw them out. There was only one way to read the judge's decision, uh, uh, either in terms of what he said or what he did, and that was he simply did not believe the police story. And that precipitated another wave of outrage in Pittsburgh, except this one went in the opposite direction. It was the FOP, a very strong union in our town. It was the supporters of the police. It was the police department, which until this point had been saying continuously, do not rush to judgment. Do not make a judgment. We don't have all the facts. There's still an investigation. Well, here's what happened uh, on St. Patrick's Day. Now, I know I'm talking mostly to people in Chicago. I'm from Chicago. I've been to the St. Paddy's Day Parade there. I've seen the Green River and drunk the green beer. Um, ours isn't as big as yours, but it's pretty big, right? Every civic organization participates. And this year, the police decided to make the St. Patrick's Day Parade the occasion for their statement. Let me show you. This is members of the FOP and their supporters marching. Uh, this image shows a shirt that they had made especially for this day. Uh, you can see it there. We support our three brothers. Here's a little close up of it. All right, you can see it very clearly here. And through the three brothers, there is the thin blue line of policing, right? Uh, I don't have an image of the front of the shirt, but there were four numbers, three, five, nine, nine. That was the numerical call sign for the car that night uh, with the three officers that encountered Jordan outside his mother's house. So the same organizations and people who had been saying, don't rush to judgment, made it very clear where their support lie, where their judgment was, uh, and the city was divided, thus the title. And the city is still divided over this case, even now. Um, so uh, the investigations began to grind forward. As I said, there were three investigations, one federal, one state level, and one internal. The federal investigation, as all federal investigations usually are uh, when they're for a local case, was led by our United States Attorney's Office for the Western District of Pennsylvania. The United States Attorney's Office in any district, including Northern District of Illinois, is a part of the Department of Justice. And the United States Attorney had just taken office when the, in the investigation of the Jordan Miles incident and the possible criminal charging of the police officers when that investigation was completed. He was brand new. He sat down with the investigation. He read it through. The recommendation was, you can't charge the officers. You can't. You don't have enough evidence. He immediately ordered, do it over. I want to see a thorough investigation by my people that I'm going to pick. They went out. They did it again. Same conclusion. He ordered a third investigation. Same answer. And eventually, he had to conclude he couldn't do it. Why? It's this. It's this law, okay? Uh, the only way to charge a police officer with a crime under federal law is through a very old statute uh, passed after, after the Civil War. And the first of these bullet points has the language of the statute that's important, all right? Uh, you can see it up here on the screen. Whoever, under color of any law, willfully suggests, subjects any inhabitant to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution shall be guilty, so on and so forth. What does that mean? In 1945, the U.S. Supreme Court says in a case called Screws, Justice Douglas writing the opinion, uh, says, what does willful mean? That's the key word. That means that you can't just have your intention to do the wrong thing. It takes more. A purpose to deprive a person of a specific constitutional right. The presence of a bad purpose or evil intent alone may not be enough. So to prove a federal case against these three officers, what do we have to have? We have to have not only did they use force, not only did they use excessive force, but they used that excessive force deliberately, willfully to deprive him of a particular constitutional right. That is the highest standard of proof there is in the criminal law. Nothing is harder to prove than that. And eventually the United States attorney concluded in May of 2011, so now we're 17 months from the incident, came to a podium in his office and said, I can't do it. I don't have enough evidence to be confident I could prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm not saying that they did the right thing or the even, I'm not even saying they weren't wrong. I'm saying I can't prove a federal crime. That was May of 2011. 
The next day, the very next day, this happened, right? This is an image from a news conference. The person in the middle there is Nathan Harper, then our chief of police. To his rear in the image in the light suit is our boy mayor, Luke Ravenstall. Uh, chief Harper takes the podium here and he reinstates the officers. He puts them back on the street. There's no evidence the Federals found, he says, that they did anything wrong. Therefore, they go back on the street. This whole thing was Jordan's fault. If he had not run, none of this would have happened. And he says in a memorable quote, we're not the enemy out there. Just answer the questions. Then he does something else. He drops a piece of information that was not yet public. Oh, that internal investigation. Yeah, they didn't find anything they could go on either. So no discipline, not so much as a letter of reprimand in the file, certainly no termination. It's done. Now, think about this for a minute. There's still a state-level case pending. The DA still has a possible case against these three officers. But Chief Harper's confident enough to put them back on the street. It takes another 11 months for our district attorney's office to come to their conclusion, which is nothing, not going to charge an excessive force case. They wouldn't have to prove any specific intent to violate a constitutional right, just excessive force. But they said, nope, not going to do it. So where does that leave us? Charges dropped against Jordan. No case against him. Judge threw it out. Didn't believe the police but also no discipline against the officers, no state prosecution, no federal prosecution. If there's going to be any reckoning, if there's going to be any finding of justice, it's gonna to have to happen in a different way. And the only venue left for that at this point was a lawsuit, a federal civil lawsuit brought by Jordan against the three officers and the city. Let's move away from the story for a minute though, and let's get back to what I called the central point. Why does this keep happening? Now we have some version of it in our minds, two versions. Why does this keep happening? I have two thoughts for you, two reasons, two twin poisons that account for this happening over and over again. They are race and fear. Race and fear. I told you this is going to be relevant to where we are now. All right. Let's start with race. Race, we know, uh, has had a profound and shaping effect on our society since its beginning. Right? The first enslaved people were brought here in 1619. We know that the damage done by 240 years of slavery is still far from over. Right? Um, what have been the impacts of that in terms of what we know vis-a-vis uh, -vis race? We've known for decades there has been well-established, repeated, peer-reviewed science that established as far back as the post-war era that the dominant stereotypes in the United States uh, of black Americans, particularly black men, those stereotypes hold them to be criminal, dangerous, and violent. Those are the stereotypes. But what we have learned in the past 20 years is actually much more deep and much more disturbing too. In the last 20 years, the discipline of social psychology has uncovered for us the real texture of what is with those stereotypes, what is behind them, how they operate, and the pernicious effects that they have. I'm going to show you two examples. There is so much more, but here are two of them. This piece of work is really foundational in this whole field. It is called Seeing Black, Race, Crime, and Visual Processing. It is a, a series of studies, seven different ones, covered in this same article by the MacArthur Laureate, uh, Jennifer Eberhardt of Stanford, Philip Atiba Goff of John Jay Criminal Justice College, uh, and others. 
uh, they used a well-known and accepted uh, technique in social psychology experimentation called priming. They show the experimental subject uh, a quick flash of a face or an object, right? And that primes the brain to think in certain ways. And it allows for experiments that can gauge the effect of these primes. Okay, so um, let me just tell you about one little slice. They prime their experimental subjects with the face of a black person, a white person, or no prime at all, all right? When a person is shown the prime, again, just a flash of a black person's face, they are able and willing to pick out the image of a crime-related object in a fuzzy image much more quickly and readily. Let me show you what that experiment looked like. Right? It's a series of 41 slides. Over here on this side of the screen, frame one is the first one. You can see this is almost like the fuzz that used to be on old TVs when you turn it between channels, right? Probably some people here who remember that. All the way at, at image 41, you can see this is obviously a gun, but it's really hidden pretty deeply in this fuzzy image. And what they do is they show this series, one to 41, of different images, one after another. The people who see the black face pick the gun out much more easily and earlier in the series than people shown the white face or people shown no face at all. Right? It changes the way people see. When they used a prime of a crime-related object uh, and showed it to their experimental subject and then showed the subjects an image of a group of people the eyes of the experimental subject went right to the faces of black people in the group, right? It changed the trajectory of what they saw. They looked exactly for right to the black faces in the image. As, as the uh, uh, researchers said in this groundbreaking article, race is a visual tuning device for the human eyes and brain. It tunes the visual system, right? Think about those officers on that night seeing Jordan with a gun. Right? Here's another study I wanted to show you from social psychology. This is called The Essence of Innocence, Consequences of Dehumanizing Black Children. When people view images of black children, they uniformly overestimate their age, their size, their muscularity, their bulk, and whether or not they are threatening, as opposed to when they see images of white children. Do you recognize this person? This is Tamir Rice, 12 years old. Tamir was playing in a park in Cleveland with a toy gun when Cleveland police officers rolled directly up on him, and uh, before three seconds were up, he was dead. They shot him. Now, what was interesting here is, for purposes of thinking about this study is what the police officer said about Tamir. Officer Lohman, the person who killed Tamir Rice, said, quote, he appeared to be over 18 years old and 185 pounds, a gross overestimation in both areas, all right? And even later, even later, prosecutors writing their briefs, writing the description of what had happened, um, all fell back on this same set of tropes. Tamir was big for his age, with a men's XL jacket, size 36 pants, could have easily passed for someone much older. Right? These are, this is just a small sample of what's out there in social psychology. This is how people, and by people, I also mean police officers, see black Americans, experience black Americans, all right? Race is a poison seen this way. It's a poison. Now, combine it with fear, all right? Fear is the other poison, the twin toxin, if you like, all right? Now, I'm going to talk about fear in two ways or from two points of view. Fear you probably would guess right away, uh, you, we could talk about fear from the point of view of African-American people who fear the police. 
And we will talk about that. But I want to do something different first. I want to talk about fear on both sides of the encounter. And it may surprise some people, I know, because fear and police, what would those two things have to do with each other? They're down, you know, that's not really how we think of police. So what's up with that? Well, it's true. I want to say straight off, I am not saying police are not brave. They are. Police exhibit physical courage in their work that the, mo the rest of us don't. Uh, former President Obama very famously said one time, uh, police are the people who run toward the danger when the rest of us run away. And that's true. I don't take anything away from that. They are brave people. But you know what? The presence of bravery does not mean there is an absence of fear. And what I found through my study of this whole area is that Right now, in this moment, and for the last two decades, police training and police culture have become ways in which fear is amped up, in which fear is increased, and it's fear of the people who are supposed to be served and protected. How does this happen? Well, let's talk about training first. Training takes place in a number of different ways. Okay, we, we think of training in the academy, then there is field training for officers who are out of the academy, and then there is private training. And this private training is very, very popular. Officers engage in it, they might pay their own money, they might be paid for by their, own, by their departments, but there is very popular private training, and the private training has come to set the tone for a lot of police training that goes on. And a lot of it comes from this. I'm gonna show you the cover of a book. All right. This book is called On Combat. It's not the only book like this, but it is the leading book of its type. It is written, as you can see, by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman with a co-author. And the subtitle, I think, is interesting. The Psychology and Physiology of Deadly Conflict in War and Peace. All right. Uh, Lieutenant Dave Grossman goes all over the country. You can find his videos online when we're done if you want. Don't, don't go now. Um, but you can find him and you can watch him and you can see how he talks and what he does. And his whole thing has led to what I would call and others have called the warrior ethos of police. We are in a war and police are the warriors. That's what's in that book. All right. That's the attitude that's in this book. Police are trained, and not just through this book, that every encounter they have, everyone with a civilian, is potentially deadly. Not just some might be deadly, not just a very few, which is what the data actually shows, but all. You must assume every encounter with a civilian can get you killed. And the only way to overcome that is to be a warrior. Because anybody would be scared out of their mind if you think every person you're going to encounter in a position of authority is going to kill you. I'd say you overcome that by becoming a warrior. The warrior meets this fear and overcomes it through his or her capacity to use righteous violence. At any time, one of Lieutenant Grossman's, uh, Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman's uh, favorite metaphors is the sheep and the sheepdog, all right? Most of us are just sheep. We're hanging around in the meadow. We want nothing more but to graze and, you know, do our thing and walk around. Uh, but there are wolves, and there are wolves everywhere. There's a wolf waiting to take the throat out of every sheep all the time. And police, guess who they are? They're the sheepdogs, all right? And you find this metaphor scattered throughout law enforcement, far and wide. There's even sheepdog clothing. Yes, there is, right? Little sheepdogs. So this is the warrior idea. And when you're in a war, some casualties are acceptable. When you're in a war, collateral damage is just part of the thing. When you're in a war, you fight to win and kill your adversary. Think about policing that thinks it's in a war. 
against whom you might ask? Those they swear to serve and protect? That doesn't seem right. And you combine this with what we've seen of militarization of the police, the proliferation of thousands and thousands of SWAT teams and of military equipment coming from the Pentagon at cut rates or no cost at all to police departments all over the country. Yeah, every police department needs an MRAP, an armored vehicle built to withstand mines, right? That's the mindset, the warrior mindset, and it's dangerous. Another thing that brings the fear, videos, videos, all right? There is a kind of canon, C-A-N-O-N, a library, if you like, of videos that are shown in police trainings, whether in the academy or in private training, um, over and over to recruits, to officers in practice, over and over, and these videos generally taken from dash cam cameras, in police cars, these videos feature members of the public killing, shooting, maiming, and assaulting police officers. And these things are showed to the brand new recruits, right? Now, I'm not saying you can't learn a valuable lesson if you see tactical mistakes being made, but that's really not the point of these videos. It's to scare people. It's to show them this is what you're facing. This is what you're facing. I had no difficulty finding quote after quote after quote from police trainers and police supervisors and chiefs saying, look, we want them to see this. This is the world. Is it? Well, it's the world they're going to think they're facing. The video frame I have here, and I'm not going to show you the video, uh, is one of the most famous and most used. It is the murder of Deputy Sheriff Kyle Dinkeller in Texas, I think. Um, it's horrific. And they show these things over and over. Now, you have to know, right? Video's everywhere, right? We all know this. Uh, it's everywhere. And that means that there are countless more videos of everything going fine, right? Of, you know, police de-escalating a situation, of police handling a person who's difficult in a very professional way. But they're not showing those. The third thing that amps up the fear is guns. I don't think I have to convince anybody that guns in this country are everywhere. They're just absolutely everywhere. And I don't want to play games about that we have more guns than people or any of that stuff. We have plenty. They're ubiquitous. And police officers simply can't forget that. They don't have the option. They have to be thinking of that every time they face a person. That's real. That's not made up. All right. When you have a country that basically looks like this in a police officer's eyes, that is something to consider. So the fear on the police side, the brave police officers, the fear is real. And you combine that with race. Right? Let's turn it around. What about the other side of the encounter? Well, I don't think anybody will have to be persuaded at this point, but African-Americans have great fears about encountering the police. They don't think of encountering the police the way I would or you would if you're a white person. It's not the same. This is Hannah Nicole Jones. Uh, she's a writer for the New York Times Magazine. She created the 1619 Project for them, won a Pulitzer Prize for it. Um, I came across one of her essays in, uh, in, in the work on this book and has always stuck with me and I quoted it a number of times in the book. She, in this particular essay, she's addressing white Americans when she says this and I'll quote, it's possible this will come as a surprise to you, but to a very real extent, you have grown up in a different country than I have. A different country. Right? And it's it's true. I mean, if you didn't believe it before George Floyd, maybe you think more about this now. It's a different country for black people than it is for white people based on their lived experience with the police personally, with the stories they've heard from granddad, father, brother, uncle, friend. It's ubiquitous in the black community to hear about or experience these things yourself. Demeaning treatment, rough treatment, guns pulled, all of that, all of that. It's not unusual. 
it's not unusual at all. Some of you probably have heard this phrase, the talk. You might know that when black parents are about to give over their car keys to a kid with a brand new driver's license, they will sit down with them and have the talk, right? They'll sit down with them and tell them how to handle a police encounter when, not if, but when the police stop them because it's going to happen and they have to get their children prepared. Now, my dad, when I was learning to drive, I mean, he, I remember him telling me, if you get pulled over, don't, you, don't ever let me hear you about you smarting off to the police officer. The police officer will be the least of your worries if I hear about that, right? But this is different. Black parents don't have that kind of talk. They're talking to their children about survival. They know that a traffic stop can turn deadly in a heartbeat if the young person moves wrong, says the wrong thing, mouths off, does anything other than acts with the utmost care. Keep your hands visible on the wheel. Only do what the officer tells you. Do not argue with them. You can't win, so on and so forth. This uh, is from a very short video. It's only four minutes long. Watch it. Find it. It'll break your heart. But this is the usual. This is not the unusual for black people. Black people do not want to call the police, right? Who wouldn't call the police if their house is getting broken or if somebody is shooting on their block? Well, sometimes they do. I don't mean they never do, but there's a privilege in calling the police. You have to have the feeling that it won't end up on you if you call the police to tell them your car has been stolen. You won't end up being the person in handcuffs. You won't end up being the person in handcuffs for breaking into your own house or arrested for being at your own place. That's the sense in which it is a different country. And the presence of a police officer simply inspires fear. It does. It's real. It's not made up. It's real. You know, people ask all the time, the police chief in Pittsburgh said, there's no reason for that young man, Jordan, to have run away. All he had to do was answer the police's question. Well, I'm not so sure. And who knows what was in his mind, but I can tell you this. Complying and doing exactly what you're told is no guarantee of being able to walk away safely for an African-American person. It just isn't. And they know that. They know that. So why would they not fear? And so now, race and fear on both sides. It's no wonder things go wrong. So let's take a minute and go back to the story for just a few minutes before I talk about what I think can be done about this. This is our federal courthouse in Pittsburgh. And this is where, if there was to be any resolution, this is where it would come. Because as I said, no criminal cases, no internal discipline, nothing. And so uh, in the summer of 2012, first trial convened. There were two, all right? Jordan has sued on three counts. He has sued for abuse of process. He has sued for false arrest and he has sued for excessive force. And the three defendants are the three police officers. Right? It's a full-scale federal trial. And you know in trials, the witnesses testify. They give their story through their own lawyer. That's called the direct examination. And the other side then gets to ask questions. That's called the cross-examination. We've all seen this on TV a million times, right? So you have a, some idea of, of what I'm talking about. Um, some of you in the audience may do these things for a living, right? So in the trial, Jordan testifies, he tells his story, and it, then he gets cross-examined. This is standard. And one of the things he is cross-examined about is the, uh, the attorney for the police officers accuses him of lying. This also isn't unusual. They say, you're lying. You're not really an honor student. 
and they question him about his grades and uh, was he an honor on the honor roll for just one semester or was it longer? They question him about his injury. So you really weren't that seriously injured. You're lying about that. But most of all, they question him about lying about what happened and particularly that he had to have known that these were police officers. The lawyer for the officer said, Jordan, they got out of that car and they said, Pittsburgh police, you heard that. Well, Jordan absolutely denied it and he denied it on the stand under oath. But then, but then the officer, I'm sorry, the lawyer kept cross-examining and here was the point. You had to have known you had to have known their police. Why? They were white. Homewood is a black neighborhood. Homewood's got a ton of crime in it. A black neighborhood with a ton of crime. White people in Homewood could only be there to enforce the law. They could only be cops. You knew who they were. You knew you should comply with them. They're white. And he was not the only one to say this. And just like that, Race came into that courtroom, had a seat in the benches, and stayed for the duration. Right? And, you know, I looked at the record. It's plain as day. I read it a million times. I looked at the press clippings. I, I talked to people. Nobody noticed this. It didn't stand out to people that this would be an odd sort of question, an odd kind of statement. And there it was. At the end of the first trial, the verdict came in, verdict for the officers on abuse of process, hung jury on false arrest and excessive force. They did it again. They had a second trial. Same set of issues, same set of witnesses. This time, the case is only false arrest and excessive force. Same out loud proclamation. You had to have known they were cops, they were white. Verdict on false arrest, verdict for Jordan, damages awarded. On excessive force, verdict for the police. What? What? Wait, if there's a false arrest, isn't the force excessive? Because it's false? On the other hand, if it's not excessive force, maybe the arrest was okay? Nobody liked this verdict. The lawyers came out scratching their heads and trying to figure out a way that it was a success, but they could not hide their disappointment on either side. The only one who seemed to salvage something from this whole thing was Jordan. In a statement a couple of days later, uh, I'll paraphrase here. What he basically said was, I came looking for somebody to acknowledge that what happened to me was wrong. And I feel like I kind of got that. Now I want to move on with my life. But he couldn't move on just yet. The city's lawyers, the officer's lawyers kept wrangling, trying to take away the damages and so forth. I'll spare you the details. Six months later, the case is settled, finally. And that's the end. Six and a half years. Six and a half years to come to that conclusion. Jordan keeps the damages. Everybody walks away. No apology. No acknowledgement that anything wrong ever happened to that young man. So, let me take a few more minutes and talk about what should happen now. Is there a way, if the, if the problems are race and fear and how that affects policing, are there ways that we can stem this terrible tide, that we can keep this from happening all the time everywhere? Yes, I believe there are. Everything I'm going to tell you has been tried. The evidence is there. Somebody's done it. It's been proven out in some context or other. There are other things I won't go into. They're in the book. Um, but you'll see. This is not something that 
uh, that we can't solve or at least address. Number one, we got to get away from this warrior policing. This won't do. We cannot have policing in our cities that thinks that the, the police department or individual officers are out there fighting a war. It leads to exactly the point that we are at now, where civilians mean nothing, where a man on the ground says, I can't breathe, and they won't let him up, and he dies right in front of us. That is not acceptable. I think that's the most obvious thing one could say. We need to move from warrior policing to what I'll call guardian policing. Uh, you can find uh, a great description of guardian-based policing in President Obama's task force on 21st century policing uh, delivered in 20, oh, 2015. Um, it describes guardian policing as something much closer to the origins of policing. The police are there to serve and protect truly, to be part of the community, uh, to guard the peace and prosperity and safety of the community, not as law enforcers, that whole idea of law enforcement. It's been done. It's being done now. There are whole forces shifting in this direction. Number two, we must change use of force law. Use of force law now is slanted in favor of the police, right? It all comes from a Supreme Court case in the 1980s called Graham versus Connor, in which the Supreme Court says the standard for judging use of force, and that would be excessive force, whether it's excessive, is how, how a reasonable objective officer would have reacted. There's no hindsight involved, no second guessing, and the jury or the judge must keep in mind at all times that these are very dangerous situations in which the police officer has to make split second decisions. What this leads to over and over and over in the rare occasions on which police officers are charged with crimes uh, or they're in court is acquittals. And uh, my, my uh, uh, friend, uh, Chuck Wexler of the Police Executives Research Forum calls these cases lawful but awful. We all know they're awful. We all know that, this, that, that the death of George Floyd was terrible and so many others. But somehow the law excuses it. This has to change. The first state to change was California. You see Governor Newsom here signing AB 392 in 2019. It is now in effect in California, kind of too early to know what effect it's having, but it's not going to be the last state to have that. Even in my state, with a Republican supermajority in the legislature, there are bills in the hopper. They're not moving fast because of the legislature, but it's being considered. The District of Columbia enacted a change in use to force law just two weeks ago, I think, and other states are going to do this. They don't have to accept the minimum standard from the Supreme Court. And that's what it is. It's a minimum standard. It's not a required standard. Next, transparency and accountability. You might recognize the gentleman on the right side of your screen. That's Jamie Calvin. He's from Chicago. That's where he operates. You might know him as the person behind the Invisible Institute organization. And through two court battles, first in federal court where he ultimately lost, and then in Illinois state courts where he ultimately won, Calvin uh, got a court to declare that police disciplinary records are public records. Public records records. And all the disciplinary records in the Chicago Police Department and every other police department in the state are now public. And the Invisible Institute has built a website where you can, as soon as we're done here, go look at every police disciplinary record that has been generated. Right? Guess who some of the most frequent users of the database are? Other police officers. They want to be able to check. The point here is that there's been very little transparency and precious little accountability for misconduct, not just in the Chicago Police Department, but everywhere. This law is going to change too. It's been built into too many states' laws. Last week, two weeks ago, state of New York repealed its protection for police disciplinary laws, so-called Section 50A, which had stood for decades and had shielded disciplinary records everywhere. They're often shielded by aspects of collective bargaining agreements and union agreements and so forth. This has to change because only with transparency can there be real accountability for misconduct. If nobody knows outside the police department, if everything is hidden, 
nothing changes. This is one of the signal and most important steps. I'm gonna skip over one or two of these, happy to talk about them soon. Invest in your communities, you'll have better places to live. You will not need as much police service. Homewood is starting to look different. And then guns, all right? There are well-known, peer-reviewed actions we can take to stop the death toll with guns, all right? The gentleman here pictured is David Kennedy. His operation out of John Jay in New York has done their interventions in a whole host of cities, all right? Sometimes they've worked uh, pretty well, sometimes not as well. I think he's been in Chicago. Uh, effort was a failure in Pittsburgh, but most places, things have gone really pretty well. And uh, we can do things. The book Bleeding Out by Thomas Apt has a full plan in it that if it was enacted, would bring urban gun violence and homicides down by half in eight years using evidence-based proven techniques. There's more I could say. But let me leave you with this. This story captured me because I'm in Pittsburgh, but also because it keeps repeating. And that's where we are now. We cannot let this keep going. I can't end my remarks without saying that it will also take one other thing. It's not policy. It's not rules. It's not changes in the law. It's empathy. Empathy. We, everyone, have to understand that George Floyd, no matter what he looks like and what we look like, George Floyd is our brother, he was our son, he was our nephew, he was our friend. Every person, we have to think of that way. We cannot continue like this. And I am glad to say that I see more people understanding the realities that we are facing and, and that black people have faced forever in this country. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you at Chicago, Kent. I look forward to your questions and the discussion. Okay, we have a few questions coming in, but I'd like to first ask the other panelists if they want to uh, comment on what they've heard so far. This is Karen Sheely from the ACLU. Um, I think that uh, the story that you told highlights the story that many people have experienced in cities around the country. And I wanted to identify that, you know, kind of going beyond both um, the inherent racism in police and all of our interactions that get baked into policing and the fear that officers may fear, feel um, that we've really just given officers as a society too much power and uh, have involved them in too many different interactions in people's lives. So if we're gonna talk about the, the scope of policing and um, how, to, how to change the, the tide, it has to go beyond reform and also um, address cutting the number of interactions that are happening on the street and stop and frisk and traffic stops and um, reducing the, the number of interactions where we call for police to be involved. Um, so having alternatives for police um, to respond to people who are having a behavioral health crisis, having diversion programs that keep people out of jail, and then uh, keeping police out of schools so that the school to prison pipeline um, isn't exacerbated. And uh, then reinvesting those funds back into the community so that um, pe people are supported in ways that dramatically reduces the, the need for police in the first place. Um, so I, I just wanted to underscore that as a, a part of the, um, the picture that we need to be thinking about. And Karen, when you were with us before, you did talk a little bit about some um, things you were working on at the ACLU. Can you just give an update on, on how things are going or how they've changed over the last five years? Um, I, I don't remember the exact date. I was here the last time around, but the city of Chicago has been for five years under a settlement agreement regarding uh, the police practices of stop and frisk. 
And we've been successful in reducing the total number of stops by more than 80% um, over that, that whole period from, from where they were before. I think there needs to be um, more work um, done to identify why stops are happening in the first place in this way and um, how to uh, rethink about um, why the disparities that have uh, been happening for so long are, are so persistent. And that's something that we're committed to in the years ahead. Um, we're also, um, we've sued since then, we've sued the city of Chicago in a lawsuit called Communities United versus the city of Chicago. Um, Ms. Samuels also worked on kind of the sister suit that, that got filed first. Um, and our lawsuit focused on the intersection of disability and race and highlighted just how deadly um, interactions between black people with disabilities and the police can be. Um, we're part of a coalition with Ms. Samuels um, clients uh, working on um, overseeing and with the capability of enforcing the consent decree that currently exists between the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago. And we're actively engaged and um, actively staffing the, um, the efforts right now um, to reform the use of force policies um, in ways that uh, Professor Harris identified and on uh, trying to, to get police out of schools. Um, there are other efforts going on with that. The consent decree is really broad and addresses accountability and transparency provisions as well. Um, and we also work in coalition with uh, a number of community groups and legal groups who are trying to reform the police union contracts that put up uh, major barriers to police reform and accountability. Um, finally, I'm one of the lawyers representing Jalen Butler in a lawsuit against a number of uh, police officers. Uh, he's a young man who uh, is part of a swim team at Eastern Illinois University. He uh, was on his way back on his school bus um, from uh, a swim meet and was the only black person on the bus, um, was misidentified as a suspect, um, took the lessons that his father told him and threw his cell phone to the ground and got him his hands and knees immediately, but was um, roughed up by the officers. They put a gun to his head, um, threatened to kill him. And then uh, once they determined it wasn't him, they didn't just release him, they detained him further. Um, we're very glad that he survived that encounter, but it is uh, an encounter that highlights the damage that um, uses a force that cuts short of lethal force, um, it, the kinds of impacts that can have on people's lives. And he's been talking about how the, the kind of hold that they put on him is very similar to the one that um, was used in the murder of George Floyd. And uh, the, the fact that he is still alive is a, a great blessing, but he never should have been in that position in the first place. Um, so that's some of the work that we're doing right now, and I look forward to the discussion. Great, thanks. So um, Jeanette, we have some questions coming in, but I'd like to give you first a, a minute to comment on what you've heard so far and to share where things have changed for you over the past five years or the work that you do, I should say. Um, unfortunately, there's no loss for work in the police misconduct arena. Um, one of the cases that I'm most proud of that we recently filed is challenging the city's um, gun pointing policy, um, which we feel like it doesn't go far enough, um, despite them recognizing that they have this problem that exists. And I think that the story that Professor Harris provided and that this historical moment um, is teaching us is to reevaluate the narrative that police keep communities safe. Um, and when you think about the gentleman in Pittsburgh, his experience with the police officers walking home, um, the only people who were violent in that narrative were the police officers who were ostensibly there um, to protect and serve. And so if you're living in a violent community and police come to that community and are only perpetuating more violence, the question becomes, um, how do we solve this? And can we really arrest our way out of these problems? And I'm encouraged by those who are challenging that narrative now um, and who are saying and who are understanding and who are appreciating that the number one proven method of reducing police violence is to simply reduce police encounters. Um, and so when we look at use of force, we also have to look at 
why they're there in the first place. As Ms. Uh, Sheely talked about, the number of offenses that we have on our books that we're arresting for that other communities or that other countries will simply give a ticket for that are non-arrestable. Um, the number of offenses that we hold people in jail for. I think the, the chief of police today just announced that they plan to do sweeps on what they've termed to be drug corners um, to arrest folks over the 4th of July weekend as a means of preventing violence in this city. And so even in the midst of a consent decree, um, even, that, even though we know that there's a lawsuit pending on stop and frisk, and this would seem to go right to the heart of that matter, that we're assuming criminality based upon a person's location and or the color of their skin, even with these lawsuits pending, even in the midst of this big national crisis, we still have our mayor and our chief of police saying quite loudly, vocally, and proudly um, that they're doing the same things over and over again um, to expect different results. And so that's what I think of when I hear stories like Mr. Harris um, gave to us earlier. I think of the number of clients who have called um, because a police officer did something to them that was objectively unreasonable, but because I, the practice of law is a business, um, I said, I can't really file this lawsuit, but I'm gonna tell you to go to COPA and hopefully get some help administratively. I think of in the basement of our building, we have an art uh, studio essentially, and one of the exhibits is from the Illinois Black Panther Party. And it strikes me every day when I walk in to see that one of their, uh, one of the things that they advocated for was community control of police. Um, because that was the way to stop police violence was to make um, the police be responsive to the folks that they are, um, that they're responding to. And to know that 50 and 60 years later, um, folks are out marching today and yesterday and probably will be tomorrow over those same issues, I think really puts what we're doing here in perspective. Okay, I'm going to try to see how I can um, combine some of these questions. So there's a question about um, how do you think, um, Professor, uh, fast forward 10 years, so post George Floyd, does Jordan receive a different verdict? Just curious. And with that, there are some questions about um, mental health and um, how police can be better prepared to have interactions uh, with, with individuals to de-escalate. Uh, are there certain workers, mental health workers that, that need to be involved? And if so, what does that look like? So the first question was, after George Floyd, maybe going a, a ahead a few years, uh, would Jordan's case have looked different? Yeah. I, don't, I don't think the federal case would be different because that law hasn't changed, but I would note that uh, the bill uh, introduced in the House of Representatives, uh, the Justice in 2020 Act, I think it's called, um, will change that federal standard in a significant way if it were to pass, which I think is, is unlikely, but it, it, it's clearly on the radar. Um, I think the most important thing that would be different for Jordan is exactly what my two colleagues are saying. The big discussion and the real thing to think about now is, you know, uh, is how many encounters there have to be between a person like Jordan and a person like those police and people like those police officers. Um, and, you know, people get stuck in this discussion of defund the police and abolish the police. And, you know, a lot of folks say, oh, we can't have no police. Well, the real discussion is how do you say, okay, we need police for these things, but not for all these other things that police are doing now and not doing so well. And one of them would be the provision of, 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 uh, of some kind of service for a person in a mental health crisis, uh, might be homelessness, might be drug addiction. Um, in any case, we want fewer police encounters, and that will bring the odds of these things happening down remarkably. 
uh, because it just won't happen quite as much. And you can do this in other ways too, but that I think is the key that's going to make things better. Now, I think the other the other half of the question was about mental health for police officers and de-escalation and so forth. Um, I think uh, um, mental health for officers, if that's what the question was intended to be about, uh, is something that's been neglected um, for many years. Uh, we see evidence of this in the increased suicides among police officers in departments across the country, including Chicago, and police departments are starting to pay attention to some of that. Uh, and to how they, uh, how officers uh, can take stress with them into the job and how it can be very damaging. But the thing to remember, of course, is that that is passed on to the people that they serve and work with uh, in the public, and that can be very damaging too. De-escalation is certainly something we all want to see, and it's something that should be absolutely required before any level of force is used. That's why we have to recruit and train officers for communication, not confrontation. Confrontations happen. They have to be able to handle those things, but communication is key. Okay. And um, so for Jeanette, um, if no sweeps, no stop and frisk, et cetera, can you propose a way to stop the current level of violence in the city? Um, yes, lots of the violence stems from historical, social and economical injustices. While we as a society try to fix these inequities, how do we deal with the violence in the meantime? Do we let the body counts rise? Thoughts on that? Well, I think that's, there's, there's two points to that. And I think implied in that question is that these sweeps and these stop and frisk actually prevent or stop crime. And I think the statistics point otherwise that stop and frisk while it was at its height um, in New York did little to stop crime or to prevent violence. And I, if I'm not mistaken, the, the New York Police Department um, instituted a blue flu a few years ago, and actually the crime rate went down during that time um, when the police weren't there. And so first and foremost, um, these strategies that are targeting disproportionately people of color and are causing harm both to community relations and to actual individuals um, don't work. That's one. Two, um, if I'm the question said something about, I understand that um, historical, and I would add current um, practices have caused um, poverty and all these situations that are some of the root causes. And to me, it's a full stop right there. If you understand that X, Y, and Z caused the problem, then fix X, Y, and Z. Um, if the way that Chicago does did its, its housing, for instance, um, they made a concerted effort. They made a, a decision um, to have these high rises um, full of low income people that was based upon race in this concentrated area um, that had an effect on crime. If you realize that's the problem, fix it. Give these people affordable housing, put them in areas where they have access to jobs, um, in increase the transportation system so that people can go out and get jobs and have access to opportunities um, that would divert them away from the criminal legal system. This isn't something we, and I feel very strongly that this, is some, this isn't something that we can arrest our way out of. I think the New York Times did a story earlier this week or last week where they found that police actually only spend about 4% of their time responding to calls for violent crime, right? Which really um, dovetails away from that narrative that we need these warriors in our communities to keep us safe. Um, so again, if we ha if the problem is mental health, if the problem is poverty, if the problem is a domestic relation, uh, a domestic relation, then why are we sending folks with guns and with handcuffs to solve it? So, so on that, do any of you have any thoughts on um, how to reimagine the future of how mental health workers might be more involved in these um, situations to to create a better space? There are basically two models out there. Uh, one is a model in which mental health workers take this responsibility on almost entirely. Uh, the, the model program that a lot of people are talking about now is called CAHOOTS, 
Uh, it stands for something which I won't bother with. It's uh, been tried for years and years, very successfully in Eugene, Oregon. And when a call comes in, this, this takes a lot of change, but you get mental health calls specifically routed to a group of people who are trained and who are mental health workers. They're the ones who go out on the call. Now, occasionally they might summon police in if the person is showing signs that they are dangerous to themselves or others and in ways that they can't deal with. But it's rare that they're not able to deal with people in mental health crisis. And this has dramatically changed that whole aspect of social life and policing in Oregon. The other model is a kind of team where you have police officer and social worker or psychiatric person uh, paired up to go out on calls like this. So the, the, the police officer is there to start with, um, but uh, the, the lead is taken by the social worker. Uh, they work together. So there are a lot of models out there that can be used, and I hope they'll be scaled up. The problem often is that efforts like this, even when they're very successful, uh, get starved for money. And we all know that budgets are moral documents. You know, you want you want to tell me you you you, you want to know what you if I want to know what you care about, I'll, I'll look at where you spend your money. And so often, programs like this, even successful ones, uh, get starved uh, or cut off. They're the first things cut. We can't do that anymore. We got to realize that that's a first priority. I'd like Thanks. to. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'd like to second that and note that, you know, here in Chicago, we've been fighting for a program like the CAHOOTS program, where mental health professionals are responding to 911 calls um, and not the police um, when uh, people are in crisis. And, you know, we're, our lawsuit is led by people with disabilities who have experienced um, police interactions and have gotten to the point that if they're in a, a place where they're suicidal or um, really in crisis, they won't contact 911 at all. And they don't want anyone to contact 911 because the, the threat of having a police officer show up um, is, is so disturbing and so damaging to them as a person. Um, and more broadly, if uh, people who aren't activated on this um, the, the interaction is just far too often deadly. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, uh, we really need to have a shift in the way that we think about this um, and, and we approach it. Thank you. Um, so what about the unions? Mm. So what are, the, what are your thoughts about changing rules about whether discipline is a mandatory subject of collective bargaining? Oh gosh, we could, I'm sure we could all talk a long time about this. I'll take the first shot. Um, uh, unions, unfortunately, have become part of the problem in most places. I'm not against unions. I'm for collective bargaining for workers in all kinds of settings. Want people to be able to do that. But what has happened uh, over the last several decades is that cities, so it's not just the unions, it's the cities in which the unions are. Cities unable or unwilling to pay more money or give more benefits have instead traded off pieces of the disciplinary process and given control over those to the union. Mandatory arbitration, all kinds of other things, don't have to talk to anybody for 48 hours, those kind of, of, of rights that a regular person facing uh, charges of, of misconduct or crime would never get. And this has crippled the ability of police departments, even when they're motivated to do it, to get rid of the worst officers. Everybody knows in a police department, it's 5% of your people causing 90% of your problems, just like any other organization. And when they don't get rid of those people, when those people are around and they have free reign, it poisons the whole organization. Hear about bad apples? It isn't bad apples. It's a bad apple barrel. And the union is part of that problem, but so is the city. This has to change. Anyone else want to comment on that? Or we can move to the next question. Ditto. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's agreement. There. I'll, um, I'll note that one of the most pernicious bits of the union contract that's reaffirmed in state law in Illinois is that in order to make a complaint about a police officer, you're supposed to sign an affidavit. And that affidavit um, will then be used against you later. 
So let's say you're somebody who um, the police stop on the street, they use force against you, they then arrest you, um, even though you haven't committed a crime. And this happens all the time because as soon as force is used, there's always an arrest that follows. Um, you're now in Cook County Jail and talking to a public defender and want to file a complaint against this officer. If you have to file an affidavit in support of your complaint, it's going to get picked apart by the Cook County um, uh, prosecutor. And then later, it could be used against you if you try to file a civil complaint. So we've just got to get that out of the system. We've hit this point now where um, the city is settling and losing civil cases where they never investigate the officer because an affidavit hasn't been filed. And um, there are parts of the consent decree that try to nibble away at this problem, but we need to get this piece out of the union contract and out of state law. Okay, next question. All people become and stay biased as a result of the basic processes of human socialization and the utility of stereotyping in simplifying our excessively complex social environments. If we are all prejudiced and will stay that way, the challenge on an individual basis is to recognize our prejudice so we can minimize their negative consequences. How can the legal system develop this very personal set of skills? Boy, that is a great question. One of the other hats that I wear, one of the other things that I do is I train uh, lawyers, judges, uh, sometimes police, uh, defense lawyers uh, in uh, implicit bias. And uh, whoever's asking that question has really hit a, an important target. Um, I guess what I'd like to say about that is that we know that implicit bias exists. We know that it is a society-wide phenomenon that people have an implicit bias against Black Americans and in favor of white Americans. We can't tell from that. But it, there's just simply no way to tell what any given person, even a person who has tested, taken the IAT, I mean, I know some of you have probably taken that implicit association test, person who's taken that test and shows an implicit bias against black people. We cannot tell that in any given situation, in any given situation, that person will act in a biased way. What we can do uh, is, A, we have to accept that this is reality that this is not something somebody dreamed up, those biases are there. And they're acting on African-American black people all the time, all right? Not just the police either, the legal profession, all kinds of places. Number two, there are things that people and organizations can do to give people tools to fight those impulses and to get their conscious minds in control of them at those most important moments. For police, it is, and for anybody, it is not true that you can be de-biased. There is no good evidence of that at all. So anybody who gives you implicit bias training says, I'm going to take your biases away, wrong, baloney, or other words that start with B. It just doesn't exist. But what you can do is you can develop strategies and training that put you in a position where those things are going to be in control of you less. The key to most of these strategies is time slowing yourself down, slowing yourself down. And, you know, put yourself in the seat of a prosecutor, right? You're a lawyer, you're a prosecutor, you got a stack of files literally this high for the day, right? And you're going to go through those things, you're going to, you know, if you've been there as I have, you know what that's like. And there's a lot of pressure coming from the judge and everything else. You have to slow yourself down to make the right decision. If you just whip through stuff, whether you're a prosecutor, a judge, or a cop, you're gonna make bad decisions and never even know it. For police, this idea of slowing down is a hard sell, I can tell you. It's a very hard sell because they have been trained, as I was saying, that anybody could kill you at any minute, and hesitation is death. All right? Maybe they don't put it that dramatically, but that's what it comes to. Right? So this is a very difficult concept for them to grasp. Uh, the best training for police was developed by uh, Philip Goff at John Jay and his colleagues. I've watched it. It's very good, but there's no guarantees in any situation. The best you can do is be aware, slow down, and have a lot of relationships with people who are different from you. 
I hope that comes close to answering the question. Yes, does anyone else want to comment on that? What we can do in the legal profession? Um, again, I think this goes back to what we're asking police to do and why. And so what immediately popped into mind is I have a case um, where I represent a gentleman who was who alleged he was racially profiled by Chicago police, pulled him over for no reason. And his girlfriend just happened to be a police officer. And so while they're deposing her, they're asking her, well, don't you ever just run plates? Um, um, aren't you trained to do that? And she said explicitly, no, they told us not to do that because, you know, that's one of the ways we control for bias. Um, they don't have their officers asking um, to to go searching for specific crimes. Like when I'm out on patrol, uh, that's not one of the things that we're told to do. And so in a situation like that, um, where an officer is just sitting there running plates, maybe they run the plate of everybody who comes past them, or maybe they're more likely to run the plate of a young African-American male in a better, in a more expensive looking car than they are for a young white female in a minivan, for instance, right? Do we know that that's true? No, would the, study, the studies tend to suggest that? Um, I believe so. Um, I think when you look at the Chicago Police Departments, when at the same time that they decreased the number of stop and frisks that they were doing, if I'm not mistaken, um, the vehicle stops for African American males skyrocketed, uh, something to the extent of like tenfold or something like that. Um, and so if you understand that you can't train bias out of people, um, you have to control it on the back end. Um, to make sure that the things that we're asking these people to do aren't particularly susceptible to that bias, if that makes sense. Huh, thank you. So what are your thoughts on ending the war, the war on drugs? Should have been done. Uh, <laughs> the drugs have won. That's my thought on that. Give up. I mean, it's, it's been so pernicious. It, is, it has hurt the law. It has hurt the Constitution. It hurts African-American uh, communities particularly. Um, I mean, it is long overdue to be canceled. That should be gone. Uh, there are other countries in the world who do things very, very differently. And I'm even talking beyond cannabis, right? Everybody thinks, oh, cannabis. Well, have, yeah, fine. Legalize cannabis, but don't stop there. Don't stop there. Look at Portugal. Look at Uruguay. Look at so many other places that do it differently than we do. A war on drugs is a war on people. I agree. Legalize it all and make it a health issue. Public health. Public health. All right. There are some comments about uh, protection for the police officers and you know, how much does it take when they're going into these violent communities or, um, you know, uh, as we're trying to grapple with reducing policing? Um, what, what do we think about uh, the safety of the police officers and um, any thoughts around, um, I guess there was also a question about uh, getting rid of the affidavit and someone is asking, um, then how would you, uh, protect police officers from false claims. So just, just all of this around the protection of the police officer, what happens during this time? I'll go last this time. Why don't you guys try it? I think the protection for the police officer from false claims is the investigation itself, right? And so if we're investigating someone and it turns out the claims are unfounded, then the finding is that it's unfounded. I completely agree. Um, I, I, and the nobody else, like I worked as a bank teller, nobody had to file an affidavit if they thought I counted the money wrong. They could complain to my manager, they would look into whether I counted it wrong, and then they'd make a decision about it. Um, we're, we're in a world where this is a job. This isn't, this isn't a, um, it, it's not an entitlement. Um, and, and there are constitutional perfect, protections for, for government employee, employment, but it goes, an affidavit requirement goes way beyond it. Yeah, the affidavit requirement's got to go. I mean, if somebody wants to file a complaint against me as a university professor in a public institution, they can just do it. I mean, they don't need anybody's permission, and they don't have to swear it out in any way. Um, once an investigation is ongoing... Uh, it is not uncommon, even in the area of civilian oversight, to require a statement to be sworn. 
But the idea that that is going to happen and then be used as a weapon is completely unacceptable. Anybody should be able to file a complaint, should be able to file it anonymously over the internet, in a suggestion box, at a window, or somewhere separate from the police department, certainly. Thanks for that. Okay, um, Jeanette, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the Black Lives Matter movement. I know uh, many people have questions about the movement. The last time you were with us five years ago, in addition to your legal practice, you were um, out and doing as an activist. Um, any, any developments on that front? Anything you want to share about the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, what resources are are needed. And along those lines, there's a question um, about the fact that uh, approximately 5% of attorneys in this country are African American. And would African Americans, uh, more African Americans pursuing a law degree assist with diminishing racial injustices in law enforcement? And if so, how do you see that? Um, so start with the last question first. Um, one thing that I love to joke about with my colleagues is that Howard University School of Law, which is a predominantly black law school, um, has been pushing for essentially the last 20 years that uh, attorneys should go out and become prosecutors and join prosecutor, prosecutors' offices in order to change the culture um, and to, to fight the good fight. And I think if you look at the last 20 years of prosecution in this country, um, I don't think we've seen really the impact that that has had. Nevertheless, um, I think it's the individual responsibility, not just on African-American attorneys, but on every attorney who takes that oath. Um, we all take an oath to swear and uphold the Constitution of the United States, and that should be done uh, equitably without regard to race, color, or creed, um, or sexual orientation. Um, I think the fact that an African-American attorney may grow up in an environment um, that allows them to better appreciate um, the story or the narratives of some of their clients can't be, um, can't be diminished but also we can't be the only people listening because as long as we are that 5% um, is never gonna be able to change uh, the 95%. Um, as to the first, with regard to the movement, it's, I'm gonna tell you that hearing the jury verdict in the, in the Laquan McDonald case um, against Officer Van Dyke was probably one of the most profoundly satisfying things I've ever heard in my life. Um, when they went through it count by count, um, for each of those 16 shots that he was found guilty, um, I believed in justice in a way that I hadn't believed in, in it before. Um, this is coming from an attorney who practices um, civil rights and constitutional law. And then to hear the verdict, um, or excuse me, the sentencing, um, to hear a judge quote a Supreme Court dissent um, in order to give an officer um, six years with time considered to serve is essentially three and a half years um, which meant we spent five years um, for him to spend less time in jail than we took to actually get him convicted was probably one of the most defeating and um, degrading moments of my legal career and my personal life. And it really made me question um, the status of African Americans in this country where you can shoot somebody 16 times, pose no threat, on camera, try to reload and keep going, and tell me that that's only worth um, essentially three and a half years in prison. And what is amazing in this moment is how we've seen such a dramatic shift in rhetoric um, from 2015, uh, where when we say defund the police, people are actually having conversations about that, um, not only at the dining room table, but in Congress, right? Um, how far um, the rhetoric and the narrative of the movement has been able to pervade is satisfying. But at the same time, when you look at the number of reforms that the city of Chicago has actually enacted, um, I think the city of Chicago is the only major city who has yet uh, to pass any reforms in the wake of the uprisings that have been happening this past summer. I believe the Illinois legislature is one of the major legislatures um, that has not come back into session and or passed any reforms. And so the question is, um, considering everything that's going on, this Herculean effort, not just from five years ago, but that continues to keep rolling, what dividends has it paid? Um, and so one of my mentors, she tells me that our job is to be revolutionary soldiers in an evolutionary struggle, right? So recognizing that 
uh, it's our job to go 100% every day, even if it only means we get 1% in return, because that's just the nature of how change takes place in a democracy. Um, I'm wondering, and I'm seeing the thousands of people out on a consistent basis over the last two and a half, three weeks who don't seem to be letting up, but I'm wondering if that's what it takes to get three school board members to vote no to take police out of schools, but the, there's four who still say yes. And one of the school board members did it because apparently he received some sort of, he's received, it was either three or 30,000 comments and most of them were for taking police out of schools, but he wanted to hear from folks who wanted to keep them in school. And so that's why he voted to keep police in schools. Um, if this is the logic that we're hearing and it's in response to what has been in my lifetime at least an unprecedented amount of activism, um, what is it gonna take to get to those systemic reforms? And that's both uh, what's a little bit disheartening and also a little bit frightening, to be perfectly honest. May I uh, offer a comment? Sure. I have, uh, and then I'll have one final question for you all that I'll combine a couple of questions. So go sure. right ahead. I want to acknowledge the uh, profound uh, statement just made by my colleague. Um, and I want to build on it by saying uh, there, there has been one set of developments that I think we should not miss. And it brings together two strands of the questions uh, that she answered. Um, how can we see real change? And what about those, pros those lawyers who went into prosecutors' offices? The thing that can bring real change is not individual lawyers going into prosecutors' offices, because if it's a toxic office or a toxic culture, they'll be eaten by that. They won't be able to do much, if anything. It's the same thing with police departments. You make them, you bring in better people, more diverse people, they'll be swallowed by the culture. What we need to make real change is power, political power. And what you see in Kim Fox, for all faults that people may think she has, what you see in Kim Ogg in Houston, what you see in Rachel Rollins in Boston, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, and a bunch of others, for the first time in the last five years, you have prosecutors elected by people who want a different system. There's resistance, but they're doing it. They're doing it. And so... I'm encouraged by the protesting too. I think it's incredibly important, uh, but protest and vote and politically organize, that can bring significant change. Okay, so along those lines, as we wrap up, there are some questions around, so we've been talking about breaking down and dismantling these walls and how difficult that will be. So do we have to scrap the current system and build it back up? Uh, are, the, are the barriers so deep in the racism uh, so, so prevalent? Uh, and, and then beyond the police system, what about our judicial system and the systemic problems that are there? Can you comment on those things and then provide us with some thoughts around how we can all get involved in terms of uh, starting to dismantle the systems that you've been talking about throughout this discussion. Well, I think people uh, who wanna get involved should keep in mind some of the things my colleagues have suggested. Um, in terms of confronting these problems, uh, do you dismantle, do you start over? It really depends, I mean, American policing is fundamentally local. If you go to the UK, there are 46 police departments in the whole country. We have 18,000 and they're all pretty independent. So you have to be in a position where you are politically active enough and loud enough to demand the kind of policing that you will insist on in your community. There are examples of a community saying, this system is broken. We have to get rid of it and start over. The example I would point everyone to is Camden, New Jersey, which essentially declared its police department in receivership and over and started a new county police department instead. And it's been reasonably successful, not perfect, but successful. Other departments, even large ones, have been able to make significant change that's made them better. So that's, in my mind, I don't think that's 
You see a huge turnaround, for instance, in the Los Angeles Police Department, one of the worst, most fearsome, most racist police departments that ever existed uh, up until a short time ago was turned around by the people who were suing the department in partnership with the brand new outside chief. And it's much better than it was. Not perfect. Not by far. So I would just say context is everything. Um, and keep your eye on this idea of what do we want police to do? Because we don't need them doing stuff that they're doing now. It's too dangerous. I'll go next because I think Ms. Samuels deserves the last word. Um, you know, one of the stories that's out this week is that the, Superintendent Brown has said that they plan over the next several days to arrest young men of color on street corners around the city in an effort to try to reduce the violence this weekend. We're in a pandemic. Putting people in Cook County Jail so that they can contract COVID and bring it back to their families at the end of the weekend is the most horrific plan I have heard in a very long time to try to reduce violence. There have to be other ways for us to address the way that, uh, to address violence in the city of Chicago. We're spending $1.7 billion on police who aren't effective in the first place. We need to rethink these structures and reinvest in communities that are suffering. And, um, and I am beyond words frustrated and angry that the city's returning to this failed attempt to arrest its way out of the problems that they anticipate for this weekend, as opposed to reaching for other solutions, especially in a pandemic. It just underscores how um, broken the system is. And I'd encourage people to join organizations that work on these issues, um, join Black Lives Matter and their efforts, join uh, community groups in your community. We represent Communities United and One North Side and Community Renewal Society. Um, there are organizations all over the city that are doing this fight right now and um, you can become members and, uh, and participate. Um, so I am a firm believer um, in working where you're comfortable and where you are. Um, I don't expect everybody to go out there and be in the streets marching, um, but if you do understand and appreciate um, the importance of this moment um, and you're able, I would tell you to join. And, and here's why. Because we expect a certain segment of the population to be mad by what is occurring. We expect young folks to go out and protest. We expect poor folks to complain. Um, but when middle-aged people, when professionals, uh, when those of us who have access to our aldermen and our legislators and our representatives, when we get angry, they have a tendency to listen in a way that they don't when it's coming from marginalized communities. If that's not your cup of tea, don't drink it. Um, but pay, but pay, pay, pay the bill for someone else so that they can. And there's organizations on the ground who are doing the work. And so if you're able, I would donate the money to them. Donate money to bond fund um, so that people aren't spending the weekend um, in, in Cook County jail contracting COVID for a crime that's probably just gonna end up being dismissed um, a month down the line. Um, if you're able, support uh, local organizations who are out there organizing students so that they can advocate on behalf of themselves. I just saw before this meeting started how um, students are making a demand uh, relative to their grades because during COVID they didn't have internet access and so they were passing before but now they're flunking um, simply because they didn't have internet access and so um, with everything that's going on there is a lot to be hopeful about and spring hopes eternal I suppose um, but all we can do is continue to fight and so whatever your circle is if it's just encountering the conversation instead of running from it, um, instead of turning it, the conversation to Willow Fortune when we're talking about George Floyd, um, if it's if it's 
being vocal when someone makes that off color joke to let them know that that's not okay um, in your presence. And hopefully they won't do it in someone else's presence, whatever your circle is, whatever your level of comfortability, um, live in it and do it with the knowledge that it reverberates throughout everything else that we do.